Well, welcome to the second session where we're talking about the story of Doxadeo and our journey. Uh, in the first session, we recognized that in Mark chapter 6, there is the story of Jesus feeding the 5,000, and there are various principles that are guiding lights to this ministry. The first principle was the changing of our mentality, the difference between the disciples and Jesus, and the disciples having concern, Jesus having compassion, and the movement from concern to compassion. Now that's a constant journey, a constant journey for me, for all the leaders, and, and every partner of Doxadeo. It's this journey of consistently understanding that we are called to make a difference within our world. Well, the second thing that we recognized uh, is that we needed a strategy. And uh, it's fascinating when you read Mark chapter 6, Jesus speaks to the disciples and says to them, go and break up this group of 5,000 men, the Bible says, so it could be that there are many more people, break them up into groups of fifties and hundreds. Jesus is very specific, not just smaller groups, groups of fifties, groups of hundreds. It's very clear that Jesus was preparing he was posturing for the miraculous to take place. Jesus knew that, that if they wanted to feed this massive group of people, in all probability it would be better to get them into these smaller groups so that I think they could monitor or be more efficient. or Whatever the reason might have been, it was important for Jesus to prepare. You know, many times in the church, people are very cautious for strategy and strategic process. But God is a God of order, and God is a God that, that everything that exists, we can see the divine strategy, organizational intent behind everything that God has done. And so we started praying and saying, Lord, we need strategy. It was at that stage when here in this particular campus, here in Brooklyn, we were running four services on a Sunday. And we had to ask ourselves the question, where do we go from here? Uh, do we buy a big piece of land and build a bigger sanctuary and and, and see if we can grow that, and then, you know, from there, where do you go from there? But it was as if, at that stage, we were wrestling with this idea of smaller groups, one miracle. At that stage, there was no church, at least in South Africa, that was doing multi-site ministry. And we asked the question, what would it look like if we had multiple sites, we call them campuses, but would all relate to one vision, one dream, one strategic process, that it would be one miracle. And so as we were reflecting on that, in God's divine grace, I laid my hands on a book, that was written by a man called Elmer Towns called The Ten Most Innovative Churches. And uh, there were ten churches in the USA that he had cited as to what they were busy doing innovatively. Five of them were starting to engage the idea of multi-site functioning. So we decided that a few of us will get on an airplane and go to the U.S. and go visit these churches. So Rick Moser, Johann von Amerva, one of the elders, and Francois Rotenbach, we got on an airplane and flew over to the U.S. And uh, 
started with Jack Hayford in Van Nuys, uh, California. He had an interesting model. He had four churches in the same street. He had bought them all, and he had laid a cable. At those days, there was no wireless. He had laid a cable, and he was the first guy to experiment with technology. So he would come up and greet the people at this campus, then go to the other campus, lead the worship. That's what he did. The other campus, he led them in prayer, and then the fourth campus, he would preach. And they would beam it to all the other campuses. It didn't seem like that was going to work for us over here. And uh, so we went to another guy. He had two campuses. They were about 30 kilometers away from each other. It was in Atlanta, Mount Perrin North and Mount Perrin Central. What happened was he would, they would sing here and he would start to preach. And then as he was preaching here, they'd start to sing on, at the other campus. And then as soon as he's finished preaching, he got into his helicopter and flew over just in time as they were finishing up the worship. And he would walk in and start preaching here and they'd start singing on the other side again. And then as he finished, he got it back into his chopper and flew over there. And then he did this four times. I really like that model. <laughs> I saw it in my mind. Doxa one. <laughs> but then God spoke. And uh, we visited a few other churches. John Maxwell had a church out in San Diego. Um, and, uh, but there was a, a ministry in Atlanta called Perimeter Church. And they had planted churches all across the perimeter of the city and had started to raise leaders. And we recognized that's what God was saying to us. That we would be a ministry that would give expression in various places in the city, but it would be one local church, one leadership, one process, but leaders raised up who could lead the charge in every one of these different spaces. And so we started reflecting on what would this take for us to to be able to see this happen. And of course, we started intentionally investing in leaders. Today, when I look back over 20-some years, I'm so grateful that we made that choice. As I see that God has blessed us in this ministry with an amazing group of powerfully anointed leaders. And that the whole ministry does not center around one single gift. You know, it's always fascinating for me when I visit some of the campuses, people don't even know who I am. As a matter of fact, when I go in the gate in the week, I have to check in at the security. Because, you see, it's never meant to be about an individual. It's God's people being raised but flowing together with one vision. And we recognize their strength in this unity. If we could establish multiple campuses in every city where we are involved, and these campuses relate to one another, we could draw from one another's strengths. There could be cross-subsidization where economically stronger areas could subsidize less economically strong environments but they don't have to be intimidated by their environment in terms of the quality of ministry. And so we went down this process to refine and, and define what does it look like when there is a multiple campus ministry within an environment called a city. We also recognize that that time that God was, was speaking to us about looking at our world, looking at our city within a particular lens. And so we recognize that there are literally three dimensions to every city where we are involved in. There is the lostness of our city, the pain of our city, and the brokenness of our city. And everywhere we establish a campus, 
We want to engage in these three dimensions. We want to reach people. We want people to come to a no the knowledge of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We want people to discover what it is to live in relationship with God. And so we want to affect the percentage of lostness in every city that we're involved in. We want to change that to an, a community of faith. It's so beautiful to see what God has done just in this city where we are today in Pretoria. Just the, the life-giving nature of the city. It's wonderful to walk through the malls and hear Christian music and, and sit in the restaurant and see the people holding hands and praying and recognizing God's grace upon their lives. It's wonderful when a community becomes, in a dominant way, aware of the presence of Christ. So we want to touch the lostness of every one of our communities. But we also want to touch the pain of our communities. We recognize that there are things that are deeply affecting people's lives. And people are hurting. And we want to reach out in a way that we can truly say we touch the poor, the needy, the orphan the widow. We are there as, as a community of faith who are not just interested in our own welfare, but we want to live beyond ourselves. We want to reach out to a, a, a community that is, that is hurting. We want to be that life-giving influence. It was wonderful just to, to reflect on, on when we start reaching out to our community um, how there is a respect that grows for this community of faith. You know, today I had to do something at the police station here in, in the city at Harsfontein. And uh, as I was navigating, somebody there said, one of the policemen said, I think I know you. He had it wrong. But then I said, well, I'm a pastor at Doxadeo. And when I said that, the police that were there all said, Wow, Doxadeo, we like Doxadeo. What a privilege. Because you see, we've been reaching out and touching the community. I remember a few years ago, our inner city uh, team just felt that they wanted to just go serve our community and just clean up the railway station. And as a youth group, they had to get permission because it's something that belongs to the city. And so they went to one of the councillors at that stage, Joyce Ngelo, who later became the mayor of the city. And they sat down and said, we'd like to clean the railway station. Of course, she was very concerned because she thought, it's not, this is not normal. Young people don't come and sign up to clean a railway station. So what's your agenda? So she's asking questions about why do you want to do this and how come you want to do this? And, and, and then she said, but who are you? And they said, well, we are the youth group of Doxadeo. And she looked at them and threw her hands up and said, Doxadeo again. <laughs> you know, that was one of the most glorious testimonies of this ministry being relevant within society. Later, when she became mayor, she became the patron of pop-up in the city. Because, you see, she saw that here is a group of people that want to live beyond themselves. But not just the pain of the city. We also want to address the brokenness of the city. You see, there are certain things that are systemically broken. And this is within the context of, of the construct of our city in the different spheres of society. Whether it be government or business or media or arts or sport, social society, even the church. And so we have decided that part of our strategy is we want to make sure we engage these spheres of society. And our strategy is very simple. It's at three levels. We talk about mobilizing, engaging, 
and modeling. Now, mobilizing, very simple, is where we recognize that in our faith community, there are people who spend the majority of their time in all of these spheres of society. When people leave the gathering together on a Sunday or whenever we come together, they go back into those spaces. They go into business and government and, and the arts and media. And the question is, can we empower them more effectively so that they can play a vital role within that community? The mobilization of city changes. But there is also a next level, and that's where we engage. That's where we actually ask the question, what are the existing institutions that we can affect? And we actually start in every place where we are engaged with the church. And we know that it's critical for us to engage with the rest of the body of Christ so that we could continue this conversation with other leaders. And so wherever we are involved, we, we seek to be the catalyst to bring leaders together so that we could together, as the body of Christ, engage in this conversation. And so it finds different expression in different places, uh, in different cities, the way we do that, but we have a very intentional strategy to take hands with the body of Christ. Let me say this very clearly. We love Doxadeo. We know God has, has empowered us and called us and, and positioned us, but we also know that Doxadeo is not the only expression of God within the city. God has many other people, and He wants to work through them as much as He wants to work through us. And therefore, we are always need to be very cautious not to pridefully present ourselves, but humbly as servants serve the rest of the body of Christ and recognize the grace and the gifting that God has placed upon others. We also have engaged education. And some of you would know that we have established this reference called TREE, Transforming Educational environments. And this is where we want to engage existing institutions and ask the question, how can we come and serve you? How can we bless this environment? How can we ask God that this, this environment can become more and more a reflection of a place where God's reign is evident? And we are so grateful that not just here in the South African context, but many other places in the world where we are already engaged, that the educational environment has opened up for us to be able to engage. Here in the South African context, we have this privilege of even establishing youth workers. And right here in the Pretoria context, we have over 45 full-time youth workers in schools serving, blessing those schools every day of their lives. What a privilege. We as a ministry are engaged in over 80 schools just in this region. The similar engagements take place in Cape Town, Port Elizabeth, in Bloemfontein. In, in London, we're engaged in various ways. Even in Stuttgart, God is giving us favor in the educational space. We trust God that doors will continue to open. We, we recognize that God wants us to play a role within the context of business. And that's why we've created a life work leadership program to equip business leaders to be more effective in terms of engaging society. What is really exciting is that through our City Changes Institute, God has given us favor even with the government here in the city where we have the privilege of mentoring and engaging the mayor and government officials in this city through the City Changes Institute. Now that's something we can really thank God for. God is giving us favor. 
But not only are we engaging, we also want to model. And for that reason, we plant more campuses. And campuses become models for many others to look towards. As a matter of fact, we've been privileged to create a global ministry now that we call the City Changes Movement. This is where other churches are now relating to us, asking whether they could tap into what God has given us just in terms of a strategy and a process so that we can assist them to be more effective across the world. We're seeing this happen on all five continents where we now have a City Changes Movement presence. And we gather leaders together through dialogue forums, through conferences, and we start coaching leaders across the globe. And there are literally hundreds, hundreds of leaders. As a matter of fact, this very week coming now, we will be having leaders from all the key cities of South Africa coming together to a City Changes Movement event where for two days we will just sit down with them and have the privilege of investing into their lives. You see, God had a purpose and a plan to take us on a journey as a ministry. And, and we are so grateful that we could respond to that, not just modeling within the context of church, but modeling within the context of education, where we started schools and said, we don't just want to start an alternative to the system. We want to create schools where other schools could look towards and say, we see how you exercise discipline. We see how you engage in different ways. It's as if the kingdom of God is evident in the way you do things. Can you help us? And so we become an instrument of grace to a greater community. And here we are recognizing that God is taking us on this journey. So over the last 20 odd years, we now have 26 campuses in nine different cities. Very soon, we'll have our 10th city, which will be Oslo, Norway. And we're trusting God that before 2020, as we are now in this last phase of this particular vision framework, in an accelerate engagement, that by 2020, we would have 40 campuses, be in all 12 cities, and that we will have a significant influence with every one of the spheres of society. You see, there is a principle that we learned. That God meets us at the level of our expectancy. You see, there is this vision that we have that God has put us on this journey, but we will see cities deeply affected, transformed, and changed. When Jesus ministered, we see how Jesus met people at the level of their expectancy. Remember when Jairus came to Jesus, his daughter was very ill, and he said to Jesus, would you come to my home because if you come to my home and minister healing to my daughter, I know she will be healed. What does Jesus do? He goes to his home, ministers healing, and she lives. But then there's a Roman centurion that comes to Jesus and says, Lord, I have one of my men that's very ill. He's a military man. He's a man of authority. He knows what it is to speak a word and it will be executed. And he says to Jesus, but I can see authority on your life. And I know that if you speak a word, I'm not worthy that you come to my house. But if you speak a word, I know he will be healed. What does Jesus do? Jesus doesn't say, no, you don't understand. I go to people's homes. No, he says, I see faith. He speaks a word, he's healed. There's a woman that's very ill, and she presses through the crowd, and she says to herself, if I can just touch the hem of his garment, I know I will be healed. 
She touches the hem of his garment. Jesus stops, asks the question, who touched me? The disciples are confused because they say, Lord, everybody's been touching you all day. Jesus says, I felt power flow out of me. It's as if Jesus is saying, I felt somebody touch me with expectancy. You see, this principle is not just true for individuals. This principle is also true corporately. Jesus goes to Capernaum. Capernaum is electric with expectation. The whole town comes together because Jesus is coming to town. When Jesus enters, the Bible says he starts to minister to the people. It was in Capernaum where Jesus ministered right through the night. It's in Capernaum where the Bible says everyone that Jesus ministered to was healed, set free, delivered. It was in Capernaum where there were so many people they had to rip open the roof to let their friend come down for healing. The city corporately had expectancy. But then Jesus goes to Nazareth. Jesus grew up in Nazareth and the people were conflicted as to who is this Jesus? We knew him as the carpenter's son. And then we see the saddest words in the Bible recorded. It says, Jesus didn't do many miracles in Nazareth because of the unbelief of the people. Same Jesus, same desire, same anointing, didn't do many miracles. Why? Because of the unbelief of the people. Folks, I travel many places in the world and I enter into many spaces and I, I, I feel many times when I enter into a, a group, uh, there is so little expectation. But then I have the privilege of engaging with Doxadeo and I know this is a community that is expecting things from God. We're expecting the miraculous we're expecting the supernatural. We're expecting great things from God. And we know that that's part of the strategy that God has given us to live with faith. God bless you as you believe with me for great things that are to come in this ministry.